Well hello and an extremely warm welcome to my channel. I'm Louise Savage of Louise Savage Muses. A very warm welcome if you're joining me for the first time and an equally warm welcome if you are revisiting my channel. So I've just had um, a most amazing um, three or four days down in London with my lovely son at Savage Reads and we were lucky enough to attend two fabulous events to do with writing. Uh, so we went to the Women's Prize for Fiction and Non-Fiction now, live, which is a lovely festival. Really, really recommend it. You get to meet and listen to lots of authors being interviewed and talking about their books. And we also were there for the announcement of the 2024 Women's Prize for Non-Fiction and Fiction winners, which was equally exciting. More about that in a moment. And we did, we managed to squeeze in a little bit of book shopping as well. So it was a fabulous few days and I really wanted to reflect on some of the books that I picked up while I was there, but also some of my thoughts about the Women's Prize and why it's still important. So um, those of you who've been watching me for a little while will know that I read all 16 books on the uh, Women's Prize for Nonfiction Long List. I'm very excited about this because I hadn't realised just how prejudiced I was about nonfiction. I think, you know, I I like to think of myself as being really broad minded, very enlightened, etc, etc. Not, you know, try not to be sexist or exclusionary. But of course, you know, all of us are shaped by where we came from and and you know who we live and the people we encounter so when i sat down to read those 16 books i think i was quite nervous about it i was quite sort of overwhelmed because i don't normally read much non-fiction and i thought that might be well because you know i taught an academic subject at school i, I you know i read quite a lot of um, academic books and maybe i needed to turn to fiction in my days off but actually, I don't think that's right. I, the more I've reflected on it, I really think that as a child, I wasn't directed towards nonfiction in libraries. I spent a lot of time in libraries as a child. And I also was reflecting on my time as a, a teacher as well. I think I think nonfiction when I was younger, in my mind, was a, a sort of male preserve and something that I wouldn't be interested in. And you know, as a, as a teacher of teenagers for many, many, many years, in fact, decades, I, you know, I spent many, many hours in, in the school library. We had a fantastic school library in, in the last school. In fact, all schools I worked in, all, all of them have had really good school libraries. But it would, generally speaking, and this is anecdotal and it is, you know, but generally speaking, the boys would be the ones who would head to the non-fiction. It'd be quite unusual to find a girl reading non-fiction texts and you know it's a it's potentially a chicken and egg situation you know is it because not enough um non-fiction is being written by women or is it because you know females traditionally haven't been interested in those things i, I can't really believe the latter is true so i think that's you know the whole experience of reading the prize really educated me and it's still true that only 25% of books put forward for book awards um, are by, or even reviewing, I think it might be, I might have got that wrong, are written by women. And that's horrific. We make up more than 50% of the population. So I know I'm banging on, but really, I was lucky enough to have a, a conversation with Susanna Lipscomb, who was the chair of the inaugural Women's Prize for Nonfiction while we were there last week. And she's been a really passionate... Um, hard-working, uh, very, you know, strong advocate for this prize and particularly the non-fiction. And I think she's done an amazing job this year. You know, the long list itself is is testament to that. But, but I, you know, we were discussing our frustration that there's still very little in the media about this prize, the, you know, the new non-fiction prize. And I think that's quite shocking. So I suppose I, I've been ranting on about this for four minutes. I've just looked at my screen. I'm really sorry, but I feel so strongly about it. I would urge you, all of you out there who, who watch this, um, to to think twice and maybe start to read, you know, dip it, even if it's just one non-fiction book by a woman every six months, 
that might actually start to change things a little bit if we all sort of buckle down. And I'm determined that I'm going to do that. You know, it's really, really has sold me. And I'm already excited for the long list for next year, which, which says a lot. Um, so it was Naomi Klein who won with Doppelganger, which I'd kind of predicted. It wasn't the book that I personally would have chosen, but I can see exactly why it, it won. I mean, it is an incredibly... Um, it's 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 an incredibly thorough exploration of doubling and you know in our world and of, of the mirror world and it explores all sorts of different very current topics and what was really wonderful was the way that it loops round to well not wonderful but thought provoking was the way that it loops round to the situation in um, Palestine and Israel currently and you know she her her speech about that because she is from a, a Jewish background um her her speech when she you know her acceptance speech I'm, I'm hoping I, I think I've got a clip of it that I recorded that I'll I'll insert here um so that you can get a flavor of of what what she was saying we know that words must matter because so many forces are working overtime to make them unsayable and unprintable jobs are lost careers are ruined, reputations smeared, organizations banned, all over words. Words like apartheid, occupation, settler colonialism, anti-Zionism, genocide. This we might think of as the word front of the war, though it does not bear comparison with the missile and bomb front. I still don't think there are any bystanders. I think we either come together to defend the right to speak freely even when we disagree, or that right will be lost. In Gaza, poets, scholars, novelists, and journalists have risked everything, including their lives, to share their words with the world. The least we can do is listen. Thank you for this honor. And then the fiction prize. Well, Simon and I both wanted Brotherless Night to win. It did win. The women's prize for fiction is Brotherless Night. Yeah! The last time we both agreed on um, who we wanted to be a winner was Hamnet. So, so when we are when we're in accord, we seem to get it right. Well, I don't know. That's two strikes out of six or seven. So, I don't know. There's a lot to go on there. Um, but I was absolutely delighted for Vivi. Um, she she again, you know, her acceptance speech was very heartfelt. There was lots of humor. Um, I want to thank everyone who helped me with the research for this book, especially the women and doctors and scholars and civilians. The Thummel people who spoke to me and answered my questions about enduring this time period, uh, which is the first decade approximately of the Sri Lankan Civil War. I wanted to write a book in solidarity with civilians who had been trapped in war and in violence. And you made that real and possible by allowing me to learn about your experiences and sometimes even reading my drafts and telling me what I had gotten wrong. And then also telling me that you wanted to read the next chapter. Um, in this era of brutality that has affected civilians not only in Sri Lanka, but also in Palestine, Sudan, Ukraine, and so many other places, more than I can name and more than I know. Um, I want to know the number of precedents and that each one makes the next possible. I hope the good work of telling these stories makes it necessary and possible to tell different stories about collective liberation, freedom with justice, and security for all. I'm luckier than I can say to have been supported by brilliant Sri Lankans, both in Sri Lanka and in the diaspora. I'd like to thank my brother for every brotherless night joke he has made. <laughs> <laughs> he really has quite the, quite the arsenal. And, you know, she started that book in 2004. Can you imagine? And again, that got me thinking because I think it's one of, one of my bugbears about contemporary publishing is that I think when authors are, you know, they have a successful book, there is so much pressure on them to produce something quite quickly, uh, you know, a second book to obviously, you know, the publishers want a, a return on their money. The authors need to earn a living. I think it's a really difficult. I mean, it's always been the case, hasn't it, going back, you know, centuries that writers have lived in garrets. And, you know, it's not it's not necessarily the way the way to make a fortune unless you're really, really lucky. Um, so. You know, the fact that that book was allowed to be so well researched, to simmer for so long, to be edited over and over and over again. I mean, she said at one point she completely rewrote it, um, I think is 
is something to give us all pause for thought because I very often pick up a book and think, oh, if only this had had a little more time, if only it had been edited a bit more carefully, um, maybe it would be an even even better specimen. So, so that's that. So it, in actual fact, on that topic, I have here some of the books that I acquired while, that's why it's a book haul, um, that I acquired while we were in London and the lovely people at the Women's Prize, if you go to the, the, the live festival, you get a lovely goodie bag and there's all sorts of wonderful things in there. But one of the things that was in there was this proof copy of Emma Healy's new book, Sweat. Now, I was privileged to meet Emma as well at the festival and she is absolutely delightful and to my shame, a lot younger than I might have imagined. Goodness, again, prejudice. She wrote the um, best-selling book, Elizabeth is Missing, which is about um, an elderly lady who's, who's you know, suffering from um, the, the onset of dementia and she's trying to find her friend. And I, and I don't know whether it's because that was the topic of the book that I assumed she'd be older than she was, but she was absolutely charming. We had a lovely conversation and she's very nervous and excited because this book I think is coming out in, in January. And again, you know, she's an author who, um, I think it's been quite a few, she, she wrote a book in between and I can't fly from remember what it's called right now. I can't remember. But it, I don't know if it was as strongly received as Elizabeth is Missing and how do you follow that sort of, sort of success anyway? And she's given this third book um, more time. And, you know, I'm assuming the publishers have allowed her to do that. And it sounds really good. It's a it's a psychological thriller and um, it says it's pulse ra pulse racing. I can't even say it. Um, and it's it's about a couple and it sounds like um, it's a male female couple and it sounds like the relationship is really toxic. Um, the the man in the relationship is really into fitness and the body perfect and that puts his partner under lots of pressure and eventually I think they go their separate ways she she sees, sees someone else but eventually they re-meet and it just there's a tantalizing bit on, bit on the back of here it says but she holds the power now it is Liam's turn to sweat. Now, that has really, really enticed me. And it is a proof copy, but it's a really lovely font as well. It's the sort of font that makes me think I want to, you know, start reading and romp through a book. So that looks wonderful. And that, that was in this um, fantastic Women's Prize goodie bag. And then while we were at the Women's Prize Live, um, Simon interviewed um, Nikki May. Uh, there was a panel of authors and Nikki May was one of them. And this book, This Motherless Land, is um, her recent publication. So she also wrote a book called Wahala, which was, again, very well received. Um, and this this book uh, riffs around the, um, the sort of concept, if you like, of Jane Austen's Mansfield Park. But it's actually a book that um, is set between various different, between Nigeria and London. And I think it takes in, you know, other places as well. And I just really enjoyed the way that she was describing this book. It's clearly got quite a lot of humour in it, but also I think it packs a punch as well. It tells the story of Funke, who's a young girl who's, I think her, I think her mother dies, um, I think. And she's sent to live with her mother's family in London who are white. And she just, it's a, I think it's about her perceptions of London from the point of view of a young girl who's grown up in Nigeria. And I know Simon has really raved about this book because he said it really encourages you to look at who we are as British citizens in 2024. Um, and and so he he very kindly passed me this um, copy so that I can go away and read this motherless land. Um, but it sounds super, and I think the um, I think the, Mans the the sort of the Mansfield Park angle is that when Funke comes to the UK, she gets friendly with a cousin. I think the cousin has perhaps been quite lonely, and they strike up this very important um, relationship. Um, so yeah, it, it, it sounds really intriguing and I'm really looking forward to reading it. 
Um, and then, um, bizarrely, I don't know. I say bizarrely, I don't think it's bizarre at all. <laughs> I don't know why I've said that. The chair of judges for fiction was this year was Monica Alley. And I, I sort of strongly suspected I might be meeting her. And I, and I suddenly realised that I have never read Brick Lane. In fact, I've never read anything by Monica Alley at all. And I thought, crikey, this is the perfect opportunity to get reading her books. So I have I have here um, Monica Alley's Love Marriage, uh, which I started reading a day or so before. I think I started reading it on the train on the way down or the day before. And I have absolutely loved this book. I don't know whether it's just the right time for me to be reading it, but um, it's it's just full of the most wonderful cast of characters. It's about two families, essentially. Um, and it starts off with uh, a young doctor called Joe and another young doctor called Yasmin. And um, they come from very, very different backgrounds. And she comes from a, an Asian background. He comes from, um, you know, a white sort of middle class um, English background. And they've met uh, at, you know, at work through work because Yasmin is also a young doctor. And they, they, they've just got engaged. And the, the book starts with um, Yasmin's family going to visit Joe's family. Now, Joe has grown up. He doesn't really know his dad very much. Uh, doesn't seem to have much regard for his father. His father's been pretty much absent through his life. And he lives with um, Harriet, his mum, who uh, is a, a sort of... Um, she, she's a, a, a really, really vibrant, uh, very outspoken feminist. And she's written some quite interesting books. There's an interesting book that she's creating uh, using photographs of male anatomy. Uh, during the course of the book. I won't say any more because I don't want to put any spoilers in. And um, and Yasmin is dreading her parents meeting um, Harriet because clearly, they, you know, they come from really, really different backgrounds. Her mother is um, Muslim. Her father has um, put aside religion. He's a, he's a doctor too. And, um, and there's, there's this fantastic meal where the you know the conversation is going around and of course things don't work out quite how Yasmin's expecting to and every single one of the characters in this book has a really interesting story arc and I, I think the the plotting of this is really quite complex Monica Alley makes it seem really seamless but it isn't at all and and to 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 something else to throw in the mix is that Yasmin also has a brother who has really sort of you know, he hasn't got a job, he's bumming around, he's, uh, you know, his father sees him as a real waster, whereas Yasmin herself is a, as, you know, has worked really hard and become exactly what her dad wanted her to be, a doctor. So this is a book about really um, very recognisable family relationships. It's, it's a book about identity. It's a book about trust, very much a book about trust. Um, and I, I've just, I've got a few pages left. You're very lucky or unlucky. I don't know whichever way you look at it. Um, that I've broken away from just finishing this book to come and talk to you. So I didn't want to give any spoilers away. But, um, but I found this thoroughly entertaining. So when Simon and I went book shopping, we went to Brick Lane in London. And we visited the Brick Lane bookshop. And guess what? <laughs> I bought myself a copy of Brick Lane. <laughs> because I really want to read this now. And um, I don't think Simon's read it either. So we talked about maybe doing it as a buddy read. Um, I was, it was, two thousand. I think it was 2000, yeah, 2003. So it's taken me, you know, over 20 years to get round to picking this up. God knows why. Um, and this is, again, a, a story about relationships and families. But in this case, it's about an arranged marriage, an arranged marriage between um, Nasneen, who's living in, uh, I thought it said on here. Yes, yeah, she's from a Bangladeshi community, Bangladeshi village. Um, and a, a marriage is arranged with her so that she comes over and marries uh, 
this man living in London who's 20 years older than she is. And of course, that becomes very complex and very complicated. So again, I suppose this has got something in common with um, with the Motherless Land book as well. You know, the idea of I'm hoping that it, that, that it'll um, have a perspective on what it's like to come and live over here uh, from a very, very different part of the world. So I'm really... I, I'm hoping I'm becoming a big fan of, of Monica Ali's work. And then what else have I got in this bag? Well, I also bought, while I was in there, this lovely book, uh, which is called We Could Have Been Friends, My Father and I, A Palestinian Memoir. And, you know, I'm on my non-fiction romp now. So it's a, it's a piece of non-fiction. And this was recommended to me by... Uh, one of the viewers of this channel and I'm really sorry because what I tend to do when I'm when I'm um, going through the comments after I've made videos is I put the books that are recommended to me straight on st Storygraph on my to read list and I don't record who's recommended it so I really apologise whoever it was thank you very much for recommending me this book and I do take your recommendations really seriously so um, all of you but this is, um, it says, as is Sh Shahada, I always feel really ashamed I can't pronounce these Arabic names, was many things, lawyer, activist, sorry, I'm holding it down here because otherwise I can't read it, uh, and political prisoner. He was also the father of best-selling author and activist Raja Shahada. As a young man, Raja failed to recognise his father's courage, and in turn, his father did not appreciate Raja's own campaigning. Isn't it amazing how there are always overlaps between books? So this is reminding me a little bit of the relationship potentially between Yasmin's brother and father in um, Love Marriage, which I've just been reading. So... Um, I was recommended this when I read, um, oh, that wonderful Palestinian book. I can't remember books, book titles today. I don't know what's going on. Um, but I read it some months ago and, and afterwards somebody said, oh, you really must read this. It's, it's really poignant and it will enhance your understanding of um, the Palestinian um, situation. So there we go. And then, um, again, something I heard about on the wonderful radio. I'm a massive fan of radio and podcasts. I, I rarely, I'm not very good at, I like to sit quietly and read, but if I'm cooking or if I'm driving or anything like that, I have to have sound on and often when I'm gardening as well, even though I quite like to, to listen to the birds too. And this is um, a collection of poems by Mary Oliver, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning um, American poet and it's called Felicity. And I heard somebody um, I think it was on a programme called Great Lives, which um, is hosted by a, an, an English uh, politician called Matthew Paris. And I love the programme. It's got a really good premise. It's, you know, you have he has guests on who are usually well-known people or people who've achieved a lot in their lives. And um, they have to nominate somebody who they think qualifies as having had a great life. And um, I can't even remember who it was now. You see, I'm losing it. Um, but one of the guests chose Mary Oliver and I knew nothing about her. But one of the things that really struck home was that she said, the guest, that the reason she loved Mary Oliver's poems was because they were overwhelmingly positive. That you read them and it just picks you up. It makes you look at nature or the world in a much more positive way. And when I saw this book in Brick Lane Bookshop, I flicked through and read a few of the poems and absolutely they uplifted me. So that's why I've uh, picked this and hopefully it will be with me because I tend to have poetry collections knocking around and just dip in and out of them. I don't tend to read them from cover to cover, um, but hopefully this will be with me for, for many, many years to come. So that's Felicity by Mary Oliver. And finally, we went into the Common Press Bookshop, um, which is a LGBT uh, bookshop in uh, just down the just down the other end of Brick Lane, and um, I picked up a manual for cleaning women. Um, I don't know whether it's a manual for cleaning women or a manual for cleaning women. Um, I suppose you could read it either way by Lucia Lu, Lucia or Lucia Berlin. And this was published posthumously in 2015. 
um, and it's a collection of her stories. But what I really, what really appealed to me about this is that she was deliberately trying to um, bring stories to our attention about um, about the lives of um, of ordinary working class marginalised people. So these are fictional stories um, in this collection, and again, an American author. But I really, I sort of I dipped in, and I really liked. Um, I think I've got, I think short story writing is the hardest form, personally. Um, I probably, you've probably heard me say this before. I think to write a really immaculate short story is incredibly difficult. And some of my favourite writers don't carry it off very often, in my view. Um, so I'm always on the lookout for what I think might be a really decent um, short story collection. And this one um, was also something that, you know, I think might tick that box. We did go into the wonderful Libraria bookshop as well, um, which is just off Brick Lane. And I thought that was stunning. It was the first shop we went into and I was minding my pennies a little bit and stupidly didn't buy anything in there, which I'm really regretting now. I really wish I'd bought a copy of one of those books in there, although I don't think they ha I might have had Brick Lane, but I kind of felt I should buy that in Brick Lane bookshop. Goodness only knows why. Um, so a shout out to them as well, because I really, I thought that was a beautifully curated bookshop. Um, it had all these really unusual, so the books weren't arranged in alphabetical order of, you know, for fiction and non-fiction. They're all, it was a wonderful melange, beautiful shelves, little reading nooks. And it was a really calm bookshop. When, when we walked in, there were two members of staff, one of whom was, was, doing look like doing accounts or something like that but the other member of staff was sat reading um uh the bandit queens by perini shroff she'd just started it um and you know i thought that was wonderful to have somebody who was working in a bookshop just sat it was a quiet morning just sat calmly reading i think that's wonderful and the bookshelves, you know, there were titles like Wanderlust, you know, and there was all sorts of mixed fiction, non-fiction poetry about just that. Um, so they had really, really interesting uh, curatorship of that shop. It was great. So um, I've enjoyed sharing my... Ex I seem to be falling off my chair. I'm going to land on the floor in a minute. Um, I've been enjoying, really enjoying sharing my... Um, experiences down in London and my lovely book haul. Uh, I hope that you're all reading wonderful things too and hopefully I've got an absolutely ludicrous few weeks ahead. I'm off to Pembroke next week um, to go walking with um, some friends and then uh, Simon and I are up or down across to Cambridge to interview Mary Beard. I, I can't quite believe I'm doing this, who, if you don't know, is a, a very well-known professor of classics in the UK. And she uh, has spent a lifetime promoting classics. And I absolutely adore the way she writes about the ancient world. And I can't quite believe that I'm going to be in the Cambridge Union talking to Mary Beard on the 2nd of July. I think the tickets might be sold out, but if, if you want to go and, and, you know, go and have a look. Um, it's, yeah, it's the 2nd of July, 6 o'clock in the Cambridge Union, so, and, and Simon's going to be alongside me. We thought, I think he, he invited me to join him because I think he thought that it would be really nice to have, um, you know, a, a non-classicist and a classicist talking to Mary at the same time. So I'm very, very excited for that, and I'm sure I'll be reporting back. So hopefully I'll get the chance to make a video next week, but we, we shall see. So take care, everybody. Um, happy reading. Bye.